So the lab for today has three parts. Um, the first part is just getting to know the EKG. It's just measuring it and then kind of printing it out and annotating the different parts so you really understand what are these different bumps, what do they correspond to. Um, so what I'm going to start is just showing you a video of what you would have done if you're hooking yourself up to the, um, to the machine. And basically all it's doing, it's putting electrodes on your wrists and it's measuring the voltage. It's all it's doing. It's measuring the voltage across, you know, it's basically across your body and your heart's in the middle and it's measuring the voltage. Um, again, like I said, there's other ways to measure EKG, but this is one of them. And let's, let me share the screen here. Oh, what's going on here? Hold on. Okay. I'm oh, sorry, my screen, there it is. Share screen. Okay. We're going to just be going down to cardiovascular EKG lab here. Um, there is a video that I put in here. It's some dude basically talking about the same stuff I've just been talking about. So you can kind of review this later. This is um, a story of but, a cult favorite, like, best-selling, this, this weightlifting-inducing, always pound. What is going on, guys? Don checking in. All right, and you can see. First of all, QRSP wave stands for eight. So Don will lead you through a lot of the stuff I've been talking about if you want to get another view of it. Um, but then he continues on. And the old school, when I was teaching this lab, when I first started teaching, we actually had manual little EKG machines where there was a piece of a roll of graph paper that would just keep rolling and rolling and a little needle that would with a little ink thing on it that would go up and down that was driven by the voltages of your EKG. And so it would literally draw it out on a rolling piece of paper. They call it a strip chart recorder because there's a strip of paper that just keeps moving. Um, it moves at a particular rate. So depending, you can use the little squares to actually calculate how long it took from one beat to the next. So you can calculate, you could calculate the PR interval. You could calculate the heart rate by just looking at how many beats per minute. You know, this is old school to actually have a little piece of paper. Um, the way we have is using that power lab, that same machine we used to get the, um, to, to do the stimulation. But now instead of stimulating things, we're gonna be recording. It'll record the voltages off your skin and it will then um, just put it on the screen and it's a virtual strip chart recorder. So it's like, as things go along, you can actually use a little slider and bring it back and this and that. But the nice thing is it's got real nice tools to actually measure measure distances and heights and times without using counting little boxes and stuff. So we are gonna use this power lab system, which basically digitizes. Um, you know, the idea of digitizing is basically, maybe I should spend a few moments. What? You know, the real, the real EKG is kind of going like that. It's going to be like sampling at a couple of hundred times a sec. I mean, yeah, a couple of hundred times a second. And so it actually becomes um, digital information, which it can, you can then manipulate in the computer. Um, so as long as your sampling rate is fast enough, you you see it ends up looking almost as if it was a continuous analog thing. Um, so this is one thing we're going to be looking at with this 
system is the actual EKG, the voltage measured across the skin. But another thing we're going to be able to look at is pulse. Um, and we will use a pulse transducer. So like, let's say this is your thumb. You know, as the blood comes in and out, it actually swells and relaxes and swells and relaxes. So with every heartbeat, as the blood pressure goes between systolic and diastolic and systolic and diastolic, you actually are gonna have the size of your thumb increase a bit and relax a bit, right? It's like a balloon where you're increasing and decreasing the pressure in the balloon. So the balloon is kind of pulsing like that, right? Your finger is like a balloon pulsing as the blood pressure goes up and down little by little with uh, in between heartbeats, between systolic and diastolic pressure. And we can put a little sensor on there that detects motion. And we're gonna, so our little pulse transducer is gonna convert movement into a voltage. So what's going to be important is remembering that there's a big difference between the signal coming out of this thing. This is literally a voltage proportional to the movement of your thumb, which the computer can then record and measure. The EKG is literally the voltage on your skin. So when we are looking at our screen, there's going to be you know, the pulse, the pulse is gonna go up and down, right? Cause your thumb is getting bigger and smaller and bigger and smaller. But this is just basically proportional to the movement. Right, a pulse transducer, transducer converts the stimulus to an electrical signal it converts the movement into some electrical signal for my computer here. The EKG on the other hand, is gonna look kind of similar. It's still gonna be going and, but this is very different. This is actually, you know, voltage on your skin. So it's gonna be important that when we look at both of these that you understand that one, this pulse signal is just coming from the transducer that is a measure of the movement of your thumb as it fills and relaxes. The EKG is the actual voltage on your skin. Um, so I think, is that, I need to say anything else? Uh, the one last thing I will say, um, I can, let me stop sharing here. The pulse transducer that we use in this lab is different from the thing that they would usually use in a clinical setting. So if you are in a clinical setting, you usually use a pulse oximeter, which I got one right here. This is like kind of one of these, most people, most of you probably have one of these now. This is like a good way to see if you've got COVID or not. Because this is basically checking your pulse but instead of looking at the movement of your finger, it actually looks at the um, amount of blood that's in at any moment based on the amount of absorption of light. So, you know, you, you, know, you can see it going here. It's basically, yeah, it's saying here, my pulse is really high because I've been running around. And it's saying that my blood oxygen is 98%. You know, that's good. People who have COVID and they're, especially more advanced stages of the COVID pneumonia, you can check that out here because you can see your blood oxygenation is really low. But this pulse oximeter, this is more what you'd use in a clinical setting to get somebody's pulse. Just kind of putting it out there. We use the little 
movement detectors because they're cheap. Um, cheaper than using pulse oximeters and they do what we need for our lab. But just putting that out there in a clinical setting, you do put something on your finger to measure the pulse, but it's a little different. It's not measuring the movement or the volume of your, of your thumb or your finger. It's actually measuring um, the light absorbance and able to detect the pulse from that, as well as your blood oxygen levels from that. So, all right, back, back to our lab. All right, so again, you can go and watch that if you want. Um, then do in the lab. So I'm just gonna play this for you. This is basically showing what it looks like when you hook somebody up and measure the AKG. And then it is also going to show like in the lab, it talks about move your hands around and see what happens to the EKG. You know, that is something you need to describe in your write-up. And that's something you're gonna have to see um, on the lab here um, as our subject does it. So some of this is showing you what to do, but some of this is actually data that you're gonna have to do or record. Like when it asks for your observations, you're gonna have to get your observations from this video as well. So let's go here. And this is also, this is when I had a little more time over and I made fancy titles. So it's cool looking here. Thank you, thank you. All right, here we go. Oh, wait, I don't, I don't hear anything. Hold on. Wait a second, what's going on? Hold on. Wait a second, something, hold on, something's going on. It's gonna take me a few more moments to figure out why my system is being weird. Is this, can you hear anything or is it also silent for you? Silent. All right, let me, let me figure out what's going. Oh, I know, I got it. Okay, let us do this again. Um, here we go. Welcome to doing the EKG lab part one. Uh, <laughs> all right, so you're gonna, we're gonna start connecting things. So Can maybe I? the screen. Yeah. So this first part is just the mechanics of actually getting the power lab system running. Um, so here we are launching the chart software that runs the power lab unit that takes the analog EKG signal and converts it into the digital domain. Like right. I said, you got, got the lab chart running. And now let's see how we hook, hook people up. Hook up picture of the hookup and the box. All right, remove any jewelry, watch, plug in the bio amp cable into the bio app socket. And I'm going to show how that actually goes. Connect the three leads to earth, ground, and so maybe you want to... Uh, and the pulse, pulse transducer, she can pick that up. So this will be for later, not for the EKG. This is for looking at pulses. Here. Yeah. All right, let's okay, let's wire up our subject. Catching, um, yeah. So so then, yeah. 
So braid. So I should mention a big part of getting a good signal is having a really good connection between the electrodes and your subject. That's why there's all that preparation, kind of exfoliating and cleaning. Um, if you don't do that, you usually get a really messy signal. Um, so it is, it's important to do good prep to get a nice connection between the electrode and the body. <laughs> All right, so and then let's make sure they yeah, see that little snappy electrodes. Yeah. Make sure it's really on there. There should be an extra in the matrix here. So the white goes on your right arm. Le uh, left is black. Green on your right. All right, so now you're going to relax. And now. Let's see, hit start. There's a beautiful EKG. Very nice. All right, and you can show show how you can like increase or decrease the oak oh, too big. And so that little plus, oh, come into focus there, little, there it is, plus minus there on the left side. And then you can also show we can change instead of 10 to one, maybe go to five to one to kind of spread it out a little more. It's kind of pretty. The nice thing about having this being in the digital domain is just sample data points. So you can display them any way you want. You can easily make them bigger or smaller or more expanded or compressed um, because it's all digital information at this point. Um, so there we got a beautiful PQRST. Yeah. And I should also mention in this, when you use this hookup, the T wave, her T wave looks really big. That's fine. That's just what it looks like in this setup. Um, there's, this is typical. You can see a really nice P, the first little bump, the QRS, and then the P wave, and then that kind of waiting time during refilling, and then the next P, QRS, T, waiting time between refilling the next P, QRS, T. And as long as her heart doesn't stop, it'll just keep going. We'll keep it at five to one. Yeah, I think five to one is good. Yeah. All right, so it looks like our subject is healthy. So this part, you need to watch what happens here. This Again, this is gonna be something you record in your lab book and you can watch it later after, after I'm done talking here. We see she's relaxed and we have a, let's get it started. And now go. Move, move them around. Whoa. <laughs> and then she's relaxed again. And it's back to normal. All right. So what happened there? We're measuring the muscles. Exactly. Exactly, right? When she is going like this, you've got all this muscle contraction happening in your arms. And what's what what is the trigger of a muscle contraction? What's the first part of of the whole excitation contraction coupling once the signal gets to the muscle? It's an action potential. Remember that huge action potential that spreads out across the entire sarcolemma. 
So all of a sudden, you've got all these crazy action potentials across all your muscle cells right under your skin there, right? So, so remember I talked about that idea of an electromyogram, measuring the electrical activity of the muscles as measured on the screen, on the skin. That's what you're seeing there. When... And now... Oh, and she's clenching here again. Here, just you can see. Look at her. She's really squeezing. These muscles have all this electrical activity. The sarcolemma has got action potentials going up and down, and that is going to totally swamp whatever you know. EKG is coming from her heart. Whatever electrical activity is coming from her heart is totally swamped by all this local activity from the muscles right here underneath in her arm. Move them around. Whoa! Right. So just so you can you can see, that's why you also and gotta be. She's relaxed again, and it's back to normal. Yeah. So you gotta be kind of just relaxed if you want to get a good a good EKG because the muscle the muscle um, muscle contraction will contaminate it. All right. So PR interval, like I said, that's that time from the P wave when the atria contract to that QRS when the ventricles contract. Um, again, about how long should it be between the P wave and the R wave? Point one to point two seconds. Point one to point two seconds. Um, with this power lab system, it's really easy to actually just measure it. You set a little marker and use the cursor. So the data, that you're going to need for the lab is going to come from this part of the video right here. So here we're going to measure Becky's PR interval. Okay, and drop it right at the beginning of the P wave. No, you can just like, like right there, you can just put it there. Right. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Okay, so there it is. The marker is sitting right at the beginning of the P wave. So the P wave's going up. And then you can move the cursor around and it'll tell you the time between wherever you put the cursor and where the marker is. So this will let us easily measure the time from the marker. And we're just going to put the cursor on the R. And if we can just read off the screen, we'll see what the time difference is. And now put the cursor there. You almost you had it at the yeah. beginning, just at the rising of the QRS there. And now we can take a look up here. And we see the delta time is 0 0.12 seconds, which is total. Right. So there, that again, this, you're going to need this when you are annotating the stuff for your lab. This is the time difference between the P and going to the QRS. And again, is this is this value worrisome at all? No, this is totally normal. This is totally normal. Totally normal. Woo! <laughs> Yahoo! All right. Okay. Okay, so for this part, for this part one of the lab doing the lab ah, stop. what you need to do is in your lab notebook you need to describe you know that part about the clenching and then in terms of the ekg we have this part one ekg pdf it says here's the data for you to print out and annotate you're basically gonna click on that where is it there it is it's open it's basically an EKG printout from Becky, what we just did. And all I want you to do on this is to annotate. Annotate meaning kind of add your own writing onto it. And the idea is gonna be mark where is a P wave and tell me what it stands for, what's happening there. Mark the QRS complex, let me know what that stands for, what's happening there. Mark the T wave and tell me what that is um, corresponding to. And then also show the 
PR interval on here. Again, you can just draw a little line like from the P to the QRS and then say, oh, that time difference there is what we just saw, 0.12 seconds. So this should be in your lab notebook, a printout of Becky's EKG, and it should be annotated. You should be drawing on it and labeling the main stuff. And I, again, I mentioned in the, in the lab manual what you have to annotate. Again, the idea here is just to get hands-on experience, making sure you know which bump is which and what does each bump correspond to in terms of the cardiac cycle. I have so, a question regarding where you measured the R. You measured it like right at the beginning of it, not the top. Yeah, um, you know, if you go in your lab in your lab manual, there's a little thing showing the PR interval. It's kind of like the beginning of the P to the beginning of the QRS. You know, so it's just trying to be consistent there. Okay. Yeah. Um, so any questions about this part? Okay. Could you show how to do, how to do the interval again for the uh, PR interval? Like, do you do you draw the line going to the peak of the uh, Q or or R? I mean, it's, here I'll show you. It's basically it's basically like from here when the R oh, let me be, to here where the QRS starts, and it's just this distance right here or this time right here. Okay, so just draw those lines then. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so and so what you should be making sure you draw, this is a P and P is, you know, what does P correspond to? Atrial depolarization. Yes, yeah, so on this page, make sure you mark that this is the P and that this is atrial depolarization. This is the QRS, the ventricular depolarization, the T wave. So mark what they are and what they stand for and also Make sure you illustrate the PR interval and give it a value as well. So again, this is mainly just so you have kind of this hands-on experience, making sure you really feel you know what these different parts are and what they correspond to. Um, so this is part one. Part two is going to be looking at the velocity of the pulse wave. Whoop. Oh my God, my. All right, this is all right. I'm going to go give you a little bit of background here. Estimating speed of pulse wave. So the pulse, you know, we're gonna, I'm looking at the time, we're gonna have to, we might do this today. I think maybe we will do this today. I think we're gonna have time. So the pulse is basically what you feel on your, you know, through your skin when that pressure weight, you know, that if I'm thinking about, let's say here's my arm. Here's like the radial artery, which is coming up in the la 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 la. Let's see, this is my radial artery. You know, the pressure in there is going to be going up or down with each heartbeat. Remember I talked about the blood pressure, there's systolic, diastolic, systolic, diastolic. It keeps going, and this is somewhere around 120 millimeters of mercury, 80 millimeters of mercury. We're gonna look at this in much more detail next class. But basically, in pressure, pressure is just force per unit area. So that means the blood is pushing harder, it's pushing a little less hard, it's pushing harder, it's pushing a little less hard. It's pushing harder. It's pushing a little less hard. So you put your, your push on it. You can feel it. It's pushing. It's 
backing off. It's pushing, it's backing off. It's pushing, it's backing off. So that's what you're feeling with the pulse. You're feeling the force and the force is actually expanding the diameter of this thing. So you can actually feel it move and kind of expand under your fingers. So that is the pulse. This is the pressure inside the little artery that is causing that force and causing those volume changes that you feel. And where is the force coming from that is actually generating this, this push that you feel? It's the heart. It's the heart. The ventricles are squeezing. That's generating that initial, that's initiating the pulse wave. So here's your heart. Here's your arm and your hand. You know, the aorta comes out, goes all the way down. Basically the ventricles are gonna squeeze. And that is gonna start a pulse wave, which ends up finally down here. Again, imagine if you like, you pushed on some water and then that wave just kept going and going and going and going, right? So when the ventricle squeezes, this is, so this ventricular contraction is gonna initiate the pulse wave. Initiates. So the ventricular contraction initiates the pulse wave. And then you can, and we're gonna have like actually the little transducer on, on your subject's finger here. So you'll see the pulse. How can we know when the ventricles are contracting? Do we have any way to know when our subject's ventricles are contracting? Any way at all? Hearing? QRS. QRS, right? QRS okay. is ventricular contraction. So when we see the QRS complex, we have a pretty good sense. This is when the pulse wave starts. This is when the ventricles squeeze and start the pulse wave. Let me draw that better. So when this is happening here, we're like, huh, that's probably where it started. You know, meanwhile, we are measuring what's going on here at the thumb with our little pressure, our little transducer that detects the movement, like when the actual pulse arrives at the finger. And you're going to see it. It's going to go up, but it's not going to, you know, it's there's gonna be a little bit of a delay, right? This contracts, starts a pulse wave, and then we see the pulse actually arrive here at the finger. But it, it takes a little while because a pulse wave has to propagate down the arteries. Um, the speed that this pulse wave goes has to do with a variety of factors, but including kind of the stiffness of the, of the arteries. Um, think about like with strings, if you have a tighter string, it vibrates at a higher frequency. Um, it's kind of like we were talking about when I was talking about just, you know, natural, the resonant frequencies of things. Um, so people have looked at pulse wave velocity as one possible way to look even at cardiovascular health. You know, the more elastic um, things are, actually the slower things go, the more kind of stiff things are, the faster the wave propagates. So we can actually measure the speed of this pulse wave in our subject. If I want to know the speed of the pulse wave, what are the only things I need to figure out speed? Or rate. This is an ongoing theme in this class. Distance, distance and time. 
And time. Distance over time. So all we need to know is how far did the pulse wave go and how long did it take? And we got that information right here. We can look at when did the QRS happen? When did the pulse wave happen? And just measure that time. And the system is good at that. We'll see in just a few moments. Again, because we're gonna have the pulse transducer running, we'll have the EKG hooked up. So we can just look at what's the difference from when the heart squeezed to when the pulse wave showed up at her finger. For the distance, how are we gonna measure the distance? You just use a ruler or a tape measure. We'll use a tape measure and just physically, and it's gonna be a bit of an approximation because we're not gonna cut her open and measure along the arteries, but we're just gonna use a measure, a, a tape measure and look at this. So this is the whole idea of this part two. We're gonna measure the speed of the pulse wave and we need the time and the distance. And let's see how this looks. I'm going to share my screen again. Estimating speed of the pulse wave. With again, a really cool fancy title. All right, so now it's time for the pulse transducer. So pulse transducer. Again, so I wrote here, this transducer detects small movements of your finger as the volume fluctuates due to the rising and falling of your blood pressure. So this is gonna be the way, the way we measure the pulse. The, the, the finger is moving slightly, growing and shrinking in, in response to the rise and fall of the blood pressure um, in your thumb. Can't wait till all this goes away. Or thumb. Yeah, here we put do that on there and it on it nice finger. and firm, but not cut off for circulation. Okay, and so I'm show again, it. also, again, this is different from the pulse oximeter. It looks kind of similar. You're putting something on her finger to get her pulse, but it's working in a fundamentally different way. It's not measuring, it's not measuring kind of hemoglobin oxygen or anything. It's just literally measuring movement. It doesn't matter for the point of this class. All we care is when does the pulse get here? Uh, sample? Yeah, so now start it up again. And there, I'm gonna zoom in on the... You want that any bigger? So just a pulse, there, pulse transducer on the top, EKG on the bottom. Even though they look kind of similar, they're actually very different things. Mm -hmm. Right, so that, because you're going to be printing this out and annotating this as well, make sure you really understand the difference. The bottom is electrical activity on your skin. That's your EKG. The top is a signal that is proportional to the movement of your thumb that we use to detect the pulse. So they're obviously kind of in lockstep because the pulse is being generated by the heartbeat. But again, you wanna make sure you understand one of them is actually movement of your thumb. One of them is electrical activity of your heart, the EKG. All right. Have a good notch. Oh, the okay. dichronic notch. All right, so now let's stop that. And now let us click and set a marker Take the marker to the QRS. So ventricular contraction. Perfect. And then, right, so that is when we are initiating the pulse wave. That is the ventricular contraction, QRS complex. When we're squeezing and starting this wave going forward, that's gonna propagate down her brachial artery and radial artery down to her Palmer arch and digital arteries. <coughs> now let's put the marker to when the pulse is arriving at her finger there. Right, so here it's arrived and now her finger swelled up. And... Okay. 
So there it is. Now I'm moving over to see the time. Right, so this time, this 0.3 seconds, that's how long it took. That's the difference between the QRS and when the finger actually had a pulse appear, it kind of swelled out. So that is that time. For that calculating the rate, you need the distance over time. We have the time. It's three tenths of a second it took from when her heart beat to when the pulse actually arrived at her finger. And it looks like 0.3 seconds. Pretty nice. Now we got to see how the distance that the pulse wave went. So 10 centimeters below her jugular notch is where her aorta leaves the heart. And then Right, so normally, so this, we were making this right after um, shelter in place started and we're doing our best to, normally, obviously you, it's hard, you can't do this yourself like this. You normally you'd have somebody do it, but we were trying to like kind of minimize contact and stuff because of COVID and things. But normally you wouldn't be trying to do it on yourself. You'd have somebody really kind of trying to get a, a good measure here. Following the subclavian. To the brachial, down to her. Right. See, I said, assuming no pandemic, another person would do this. You know, you know, because you don't have blood vessels going through the air, getting down to your hand. It's their insides. So you want to really kind of push the thing against your skin. Finger. Yep. And. So we have 105 centimeters, you know, so in your lab book, you know, for this subject, you should put in the data you have for her pulse, the rate, the speed of her pulse wave, because you have the distance, you have the time, so you can calculate the rate. Cool. All right. So you should use that data. Um, again, do I have? I don't. All right. So now what, it's what time stuff? for the EKG pulse. So here, let's open. You know, in your lab notebook, you should also print out this piece, which we have here for part two, which is basically showing the QRS and the pulse at the same time. So annotate this, make sure in your description, in your lab notebook, you talk about how you actually figured out the time and use this picture here, use this graph, this printout, so you can clearly dis you know, discuss in your lab write-up how you actually figured out the time it took for the pulse wave. So in your discussion, you explain how you calculated that rate. You know, and it's, obviously it's gonna make sure you describe and annotate the idea of when the pulse wave initiated at the QRS and when it arrived at her finger with the pulse transducer. So in your lab write-up, print this one out as well and use this as part of your discussion of part two. Uh, do we actually need to use the grids on this to find it or do we just use the information that was given in the video? Use the information in the video. This is okay. the this is the printout from Becky. Same, same thing. Okay. The same thing. Okay. Any questions about that part? Okay. The last part. Part three is arterial anastomoses. So let's talk about what is anastomosis. Anastomosis is just when you have multiple ways for the blood to get to the same place. 
So these are like um, multiple paths to same destination. You know, in your veins, veins are heavily anest. Have there's tons of veins. Like if you wanna, if you're in your hand and you wanna get back to the heart, you can go down the brachial vein, or you can go down the cephalic vein, or you go down the basilic vein. There are so many veins to go from one place to another. Um, particularly because they're low pressure, you've got you know, you, you've got lots and lots of ways. And arteries in general do not have as much anastomosis. There's famous ones like the circle of Willis in the brain. And then there's an anastomosis in how the blood gets down to your hand. So let's draw that out here. Here's your heart. You've got your subclavian. You've got the brachial artery, which you are all going to get to know much better next class. Brachial artery going down your upper arm. And then it splits. It splits into a radial artery going towards your thumb and an ulnar artery going towards your pinky. The radial artery is one that you often feel. It's, it's big and beefy and right near the skin. So you can actually really feel it well. When people take your pulse on your wrist, you're pushing right near, you know, on the wrist near the thumb, that's the radial artery you're feeling. Um, and then when they get into the hand, they make a loop. It's called the palmar arch. And then the digital arteries that go into your fingers come off of that. So the basic idea here now is there's an anastomosis. There's multiple paths. If I want to get to my middle finger, I could go down the radial artery and come there but I could just as well go down the ulnar artery and get there as well. So there's more than one way to get there. So what would you expect? If I, if I blocked, if I pushed hard on the radial artery, what would happen to the pulse at my finger? Would the pulse go away? If I, if I blocked here? No. No, because the blood can keep coming down the ulnar artery, right? If I block the ulnar artery, would the pulse disappear on my finger? Yes, no? No. No. Again, let's have somebody else. Why? I want to make sure people are following this. Because blood's coming from the other artery and... Uh feeding this palm arch. So what if I block the rate, the brachial artery here? And you won't feel a pulse. Right, then you're basically cutting off most of the blood flow down to the lower arm. You know, these actually, these, these pressure points like that, it's important. Like, you know, if somebody has some horrible bandsaw accident and they just cut off all their fingers and you just got all this blood spurting out of their hand, and you want to like stop them from bleeding to death right now, you know, if you just use your, you know, thumb and push on the brachial artery, you can stop most of the blood flow going down to the hand there. Whereas if you just pushed on the radial artery or the ulnar artery, it's not necessarily going to accomplish what you're looking for. Um, so this last part is going to be exactly what we're talking about. We're going to be looking at the pulse at the finger. And then we're gonna be pushing. Let's block the radial artery and see what happens to the pulse. Let's block the ulnar artery and see what happens to the pulse. Let's block the brachial artery and see what happens to the pulse. 
So this is, again, using this machine because it gives us a nice readout of the pulse. And we can see how the pulse is affected by occluding, by blocking these different major arteries that are serving the arm here. So I'm going to share part three here, arterial anastomosis in the hand. Again, with an awesome little title screen. All right, so now she's taken off. Right, at this point, we don't care. We're not doing the EKG anymore. We're just looking at pulse. It just has the pulse transducer. Okay, so then I'm gonna start this. Start this. I'm gonna pull this down, make it a little bit bigger. Okay. Start. Because right now, all we care about is the pulse. Right, you can actually increase the uh, magnification a little bit on there. Okay, so we have a nice pulse. Um, okay, so now it's your... Oh, it's my brain. brachial. Yeah. Okay. So she's pushing on her brachial artery, and look so, what happens. There you go. Nice. You can see the Arm pulse. Pressure. All right, so now take that. Right, so does everybody, that makes sense, right? Like you stop at that place that's feeding both of the radial and ulnar, nothing's making it down to her hand. There's no pulse there. Again, this is also showing why that's a good pressure point if you're trying to block hemorrhaging from some bad like hand wound, because it's basically stopping most of the flow into the arm there. Get off. Okay, here we go. All right. So she lets go. It's and coming back. And then show her without it, her hand there anymore. Okay. So see All right, now go on to your radial. It's down, it's... but it's still there. Whoa. Uh -oh. Whoa. Whoa. All right. <laughs> go <laughs> on to your, your ulnar. Again, it's lower. So you have the majority that come through your radial. <laughs> interesting. Yeah, that was interesting. Hmm. All right. That's so now interesting. you're going to put it on both. Whoop. Yeah. Ready? So what are you going to expect if she compresses both the ulnar and the radial at the same time? No pulse. Exactly. There nice. we go. Nice. All right. And then beautiful. Yeah. So in your write-up for this, there are four PDFs, actually five PDFs, right? The first one is just a regular pulse. You know, this is what the pulse looks like normally. You know, the next one is blocking the ulnar. Whoop, that's not it. Um, Here it was normal and here now you can see at this point is where she's blocking it, it's, it's lower. Um, another one is blocking the radial. Again, you can see the normal and then you can see it go down here. Again, not disappear, but definitely less. Um, Serena? Oh, I thought you waved your, you raised your hand. No, just moving about. Okay. Um, blocking both the radial and ulnar, and blocking not the so here we have blocking both radial and ulnar, and you can see what happens from the pulse, and then we also have blocking the brachial artery, and you can see what happens. So again, these should be the figures in your description of what happens when you are playing around. And you know, so describe what happens. You can use these pictures, these figures to support it from these PDFs, and also just describe why it makes sense, why these results make sense in your write-up. So does, does that make sense? Okay. So are there any questions about this whole EKG lab?
Um, so we have a little bit of time. So what I want to do now is the heart sounds and pulse. Okay, so the next part of the lab is where we, it's also, we can't do because it's, we don't, we're not in person. It's the fun stuff of using a stethoscope. Um, when you have a stethoscope, if I, let me just, I can just, it's easier if I just show this. When a healthy heart beats, it makes a lub dub sound. The first heart sound, lub, also known as S1, is caused by the closing of the AV valves after the atria have pumped blood into the ventricles. The second heart sound, dub, or S2, originates from the closing of the aortic and pulmonary valves right after the ventricles have ejected the blood. The and I should, in this video, this is more of a realistic position. The semilunar valves are actually up on the top here because the aorta actually leaves the top. In my drawing, I kind of drew it down on the bottom to make it just easier to draw and not less confusing. But this heart here is more anatomically correct. But so in your write-up, you're not going to actually listen to anybody's heart, but you should be able to describe what is the LUP sound, what is the DUP sound. You are responsible for knowing what's creating those sounds of the heartbeat. time interval between S1 and S2 is when the ventricles contract, called systole. The interval between S2 and the next S1 is when the ventricles relax and are filled with blood, called diastole. Diastole is longer than systole, hence the lub-dub, lub-dub, lub-dub. Right, so the systole, that's the ventricular contraction, right? As the ventricles start to contract, it's going to slam the AV. As the ventricles are done contracting, the semilunar valve slams shut to keep the blood from back flowing so we can enter into diastole. So that lupt up is during systole of ventricular systole. And then a longer period diastole is the refilling of the ventricles till the next cardiac cycle begins. Heart sounds are auscultated at four different sites on the chest wall. So that word auscultate, that's the fancy word for just listen auscultate. Um, we'll be talking about the auscultatory method for assessment of blood pressure on Thursday. No, wait, today is Thursday. Um, next week. Which correspond to the location of blood flow as it passes through the aortic, pulmonic, tricuspid, and mitral valves, respectively. This is how similar defects associated with different valves are differentiated. Heart murmurs are whooshing sounds produced by turbulent flow of blood. Murmurs are diagnosed based on the time they occur in the cardiac cycle, their changes in intensity over time, and the auscultation site where they are best heard. Examples of conditions associated with common systolic murmurs include mitral valve regurgitation, when the mitral valve does not close properly and blood surges back to the left atrium during systole, the murmur starts at S1 when the AV valves close and maintains the same intensity for the entire duration of systole. This hollow systolic murmur is best heard at the mitral region, the apex, with radiation to the left axilla. On the other side of the heart, a tricuspid valve regurgitation has similar timing and shape, but is loudest in the tricuspid area, and the sound radiates up along the left sternal border. Aortic valve stenosis. When the aortic valve does not open properly and blood is forced through a narrow opening, so the I'm, blood flow starts small, rises to a max. I'm speeding this up because it's fun for you to see this. You are not responsible for the, um, diagnosing any of these heart murmurs or anything. I'm just kind of giving, I'm putting this out here so you get a sense that in addition to hearing the heartbeat, you can hear lots of other stuff and it's very useful diagnostically. So I'm gonna play this at speed and a half so you see it, but don't stress. Again, you should know what the LEP and the DEP sounds are. You do not need to know um, how to diagnose a murmur. 
maximum in mid-systole at the peak of ventricular contraction, then attenuates toward the end of systole. This results in a crescendo-decrescendo, or a diamond-shaped murmur, which starts a short moment after S1. It is often preceded by an ejection click caused by the opening of the stenotic valve. Aortic stenosis murmur is loudest in the aortic area and the sound radiates to the carotid arteries in the neck following the direction of blood flow. Again, on the other side of the heart, a pulmonic stenosis has the same characteristics but is best heard in the pulmonic area and does not radiate to the neck. Other conditions that cause audible systolic murmurs include ventricular septal defect and mitral valve prolapse. An example of diastolic murmurs is aortic valve regurgitation. This is when the aortic valve does not close properly, resulting in blood flowing back to the left ventricle during diastole, the filling phase. As the blood flows in the reverse direction, the murmur is best heard not in the aortic area, but rather along the left sternal border. It peaks at the beginning of diastole when the pressure difference is highest, then rapidly decreases as the equilibrium is reached. Other common diastolic murmurs are associated with pulmonic regurgitation, mitral stenosis, and tricuspid stenosis. Thank you for watching. Please feel free to suggest a topic you want us to cover by leaving a comment below. All right. So that gives you a sense of, and again, for your lab write-up, there's not much for you to do for this part one or for, um, the, oh, no, bars, okay. the part one auscultating heart sounds, all I want you to do is kind of just describe what is a basic heartbeat sound like and what causes it. That's all I want you to do for part one. Part two, um, palpating superficial pulse points. That is something I actually do want you to do. Um, this is feeling the pulse on these different arteries around your body. Um, we talked about the radial pulse on the radial artery, you know, right on your wrist near your thumb. You know, the carotid pulse, the carotid artery going up your neck. Um, in fact, let me stop sharing here. You know, temporal artery. Temporal artery is, you know, your temple here. There's an, an artery there that you can feel pulsing. In fact, I feel mine right now. Um, facial artery is much more delicate. It's kind of right under your jawline here and you can feel a little pulse in there. Radial artery is easy. Radial artery is that one right on your wrist here. Um, femoral artery is going down in your groin area. It's kind of right, right near the fold, kind of right inside here. You can feel that one. Um, popliteal artery behind your knee. That one can be trickier to feel. Um, posterior tibial is near your inside ankle. Um, dorsal pedis is on top of your foot. Um, so your lab manual has a picture as well as a very brief description of where these are. Um, what I am going to do right now to end this for the next 10 minutes I'm going to put you or whoever's left here into breakout rooms. And I want you to discuss amongst yourself. You can, again, you have this just, you have to feel it on yourself and describe what the, what the um, pulse is like. Is it strong? Is it weak? Can you find it at all? Um, what kind of things are going to affect the strength of a pulse? how close it is to the aorta. So that won't actually make a difference really. Um, given that these major arteries have, they're kind of wide and there's very little resistance. Um, basically the, the pressure um, coming out of the aorta is gonna be very similar to the pressure at all of these major um, arteries that you're actually pushing on. So the distance from the heart is not going to be such a, such a problem. Uh, not the distance from the heart, but from the aorta. So like the femoral artery seems like it would be stronger because it's like bigger and close to like where it might like bifurcate from the abdominal aorta. But so there it's more because it's a large diameter still. Yeah. So yeah, more about the diameter size, not yeah, the so, distance. Okay. Yeah, so I'd say not the distance, but the diameter, a larger, a larger one has a potential of being stronger. Um, 
Although the aorta is like the largest of all and you can't palpate your aorta. So what else is really important? Distance from the surface of... Yeah, I mean, how deep it is. Is it near the skin or not? And not only that, what's underneath it? Is there something that you can comp compress it against? Right, if you have, you could have a big thing pulsing and you push on it, it just is running away from you. So, but if you can clip it between your skin and some underlying bone, and then it's going, then you can really feel it, right? So there's a variety of things that are gonna affect the strength. There's the, obviously the size of the artery, but that's gonna be um, just a little, one part of it. It can be really big and you can't feel it if it's too deep or there's nothing kind of compressing or blocking from behind to, you know, that give you something to push against. Um, checking pulses is a really big diagnostic tool for checking if there's adequate blood flow to different parts of your body. Um, and also I should say blood, the pulse, has a lot more going on than just the pulse rate and the strength. Like those are two things that you can think about that are very obvious. You know, you can count how many beats per second. You can say, oh, it's strong or it's weak. What other things can we determine about feeling the pulse? What other, what other qualities of the pulse? Does anybody? If anybody knows anything about like traditional Chinese medicine, they have whole things of pulse diagnosis and in Western medicine as well, they look at there's regular, or irregular. And even if it's regular, is it like impulsive or is it smooth? Like does the pulse feel like, uh, 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 or is it like, like wah, wah, wah. Um, so they talk, and you know, people talk about the pulse feels thready or the, this and that. There's lots of different things beyond just the strength and the speed that actually give you information. So just, you know, we're not going into that so much, but just putting that out there that pulse is more complicated than just strength and, and, um, and pulse rate. There's also other qualities about just the shape of it and all that and how it feels.